Sure sorry about canceling the Alzheimer's Center this afternoon, but just unable to <clears throat> get that out more than probably this morning, so I appreciate your understanding on that. Hope we'll get back to that in a couple of weeks. If you have your Bibles, be turning over to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Like everyone else, looking forward and looking towards spring. I think all of us will feel a whole lot better as spring rolls around. Galatians 3, beginning with verse 6. There, let's read that together. He says, even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are not, uh, which are of faith, the same are children of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. <clears throat> when you think back about your spiritual birth, your baptism, what kind of memories do you have? For many of us, that goes back quite a few years. And so it may be difficult, but seemingly, I know for me, it's some memories I have in place there about my baptism. At a young age, though, I still remember the preacher at Niceville where I attended, Brother Hannah, talking with me before baptism and explaining to me making sure that I understood what I was doing and why I was doing it. And I still remember his reasoning. I don't want you to come back years later and say, well, I didn't know what I was doing. And so when you remember the things that you did, do you remember when you walked in that water and were about to be baptized? Maybe you weren't nervous. I certainly remember I was. It was one of those moments. It wasn't that I was scared of the water. Growing up around the water, the water didn't bother me. So what was I scared of? Maybe scared or frightened isn't the right word. Maybe it's just being nervous. But I think for most, we may get a little nervous because we know that what we are doing is a life-changing experience. There is nothing, I mean nothing, in your life more important than putting Christ on in baptism. And as that preacher or the one that did the baptism asked, do you believe with all of your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? There's not a more important question in the Scriptures than that. Do you accept him as your Lord and Savior? Nothing more important than understanding how all of that plays out. It was indeed a great day. There may have been others around you letting you know how welcoming they were. As you got dressed, maybe you came out to song or prayer. For some of us, that day was a long time ago for others. Not so long. But the fact of the matter is, God was willing to accept our faith at that moment. He was willing to add us to his church at the moment that our faith culminated in the baptism. And we came up out of that watery grave a new creature. And certainly it took that to put us where we are today as his children. God was willing to take our faith, use that faith to justify us before him. The one thing that's interesting here to me with Paul is that he begins to talk about that faith that saves. 
And isn't it interesting that he looks at Abraham? He uses Abraham as an example. This is a topic that really the entire letter here, Paul has been pushing this agenda. And the reason this topic or agenda is so important is that, as I mentioned last week, it is the difference between heaven and hell. The ability to stand before God sinless depends upon this. No, we're not going to be sinless in this life. But you see, His grace is going to allow us through our obedience, through that faith that saves. As one preacher put it one time, the faith that saves is the faith that obeys. And so this faith that saves allows us to be put before the throne of God sinless. Not that we haven't made our share of mistakes. And the longer we live, the longer that list becomes. Unless we die as soon as we come out of that watery grave of baptism, very unlikely that we die in a perfect state as one might imagine. It is that grace that takes care of us there. Faith is defined as believing in something that you cannot see. That's what the Hebrew writer says. Hebrews 11, 1, faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Accepting something that you don't have physical evidence to show. Folks, I'm gonna tell you this morning, that the definition of faith goes further. It's much more than just saying you want something. It's a life-changing event. And if it's not, then there is a problem. Again, looking at Hebrews 11, 1 and 2, where he says, now faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it, the elders obtained a good report. Faith is an integral part of who you are, what you are, and most certainly, where you're going. Hebrews 11, 6 says, without it, it is impossible to please God. So when we talk about salvation, we've got to talk about faith. You can't have one without the other. When you look at the story of Enoch, we're told that he pleased God and did not see death. And that's when the writer explains that in verse 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith not only believes that God exists, but it believes that there's a reward for those who seek him and have found him and believe in him and obey him. I don't have a lot of evidence of heaven. I can't throw a picture up here on the screen. I want y'all to take a look at heaven. All I have is what the Bible reveals to us about this place. I may not have a lot of evidence of heaven, but I sure got a lot of evidence of God. The world we live in denies that. But it's foolishness to look around or to even look in the mirror and not realize that we are created beings, created in the image of God. It's foolish to look around at nature and not understand that someone, something has set all of these things in motion. Day to night, season to season. Someone, something set that in motion. And it's not just by happen chance. Life also shows there's something greater than me that guides me, that leads me, strengthens me. So 
when I believe that God exists and I seek Him, <laughs> that allows me to get closer to heaven. So, Paul pushes these Christians and asks them to think about their start with God. And when you look at verses 1 through 5, you see him kind of pushing the envelope there. Think about this. Think about what you're doing here. When he begins by talking about how foolish they are. And sometimes we can say a lot of foolish things. He begins there in verse 1 with, Oh, foolish Galatians. Sometimes the same thing could be said about us. Oh, foolish Galatians. But then he brings the spotlight to Abraham and you. Abraham and you. How is this transformation, this transformational faith, how is it to take place? Paul tells us in several different areas how all of these things are going to go down. We know that the cross <coughs> has to be the foundation. If the cross is not the foundation, then you can certainly understand there's not going to be much of any kind of faith. You don't have faith in the cross of Jesus. You don't have faith in Jesus. And if you don't have faith in Jesus, you don't have faith in God. So you can kind of see where that snowball effect is. The cross is the foundation. Not only here in Galatians, but throughout Paul's writings. The cross is the foundation. Rules are great. They keep you moving forward. But rules aren't the source of your salvation. If you simply look to the word of God for what you shouldn't be doing, then you fail to focus on the word of God in what you should be doing. If we only focus on the thou shalt nots, well, I don't commit adultery. I don't bear false witness. I haven't murdered anyone. I haven't stolen anything from anyone. If that's all you focus on, then your focus isn't where it should be. I mean, those things are important that you don't do them. But you've got to be more than just a person that goes around keeping those so-called commandments or keeping those laws that have been set forth. They're not the source of your salvation. Jesus is the source of your salvation. We claim that grace by grace we're placing our faith in him. But how is God and the Spirit working in us? Are we controlling the Spirit of God in us? If so, we're not really allowing God to work. We're kind of forcing God into a particular box that He's not going to fit in. He's not going to go in. So we want to work in this transformational faith and life in a way that shows that we are made in the image of God and God is not made in the image of me. I'm not in control of this. God is. What's Paul's point here? Well, his point is that a trusting, believing faith is what will change you. It's not your works that will change you, but it's that trusting, believing faith that will change you. And he brings that to light by bringing in Abraham and saying, just like Abraham, that trusting, believing faith changed Abraham, that trusting, believing faith can change you. So when we look at Abraham, what saved him? Was it circumcision? Or was it faith in something that he really could not prove? 
There in verse 6 through 9 is really what he's saying. Even as Abraham believed God and it was accounted him for righteousness. He goes on and he says, look. Look what Abraham did even though he didn't really fully understand it. He didn't fully comprehend. But he did it. And folks, we got to have faith in something. We got to have faith in somebody. Sometimes from a physical standpoint, we look at doctors and we say, well, I just don't know if I like the diagnosis. Well, sometimes we say, what choice do I have? I got to have faith in somebody. I got to have faith in something. Well, God is on a much higher plane. So I truly want to make sure that my faith is right towards him. <coughs> the Jews were quick, quick to claim that Abraham as their father was their father and was the beginning of their race. But God wanted Abraham to believe that he would be the father of many people. See, the Jews didn't get that. When you talk about through thy seed, all nations will be blessed. The Jews didn't get how ultimately, and I don't know that Abraham did either. That ultimately that would be fulfilled truly with all nations and all people would be invited. That he would be the father of many. This was said at a time when he had no children, zero. How much faith did it take for Abraham to believe when he thought he was at the point where he couldn't have children? In Genesis 15, Abram talks frankly with God. And he asks God, what will you give me? For I continue to be childless. Then in Genesis 15, verses 4 through 6, God gives him an answer. Remember, sometimes it may not be the answer that we like, but he gets an answer. Genesis 15, beginning with verse 4, he says, And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, this shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. God counted the faith of Abraham as righteousness. Make no mistake. When you study the life of Abraham, you see mistake after mistake after mistake with Abraham. I don't think Abraham fully understood what God's plan was for him. But it never stopped him from believing in God. And it never stopped him from being looked upon and God counting his righteousness as he did. He never stopped believing that God would make these things happen. The covenant sign of circumcision came after this story. So it was faith that believed even though it just didn't make any sense. In your life this morning, it's faith that makes you believe. Even when there are things that are happening in your life that just don't make any sense. So as you evaluate where you are this morning, are you where you need to be? Because if you're not a New Testament child of God, you're not where you need to be. And if you're a New Testament child of God that's wandered away, you're not where you need to be. If we can help you, Get to where you need to be. Come now while we stand and sing.